I'm in it. I, uh, think, I think everything's a practice run. Like you have to look at everything like it's a practice run. Absolutely. Because, because you're never gonna be at the top of your game because there's always another level. And so, and so if you look at it like when you're making cold calls, if you're scared to make calls, right? Go ahead and make 5,000 calls, not expecting to get any deals out of it. Look at that as a practice run, right? These, these speeches I'm doing are practice runs for me. This is practice. Same here. Right? When I, when I, go, when I start speaking for thousands of people, that's going to be practice for me from what I'm going to talk to tens of thousands of people. Everything is a practice run for the real thing that never comes. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Zero to Diamond podcast. I'm your host, Ricky Carruth. I'm on a mission to help reduce the failure rate in the real estate industry by helping you master your skills on the phone, conquer your fears, and changing your mindset. Now, let's get into the show. What's up, guys? Welcome to the next episode of the Chris Donaldson Project. This is your host, the Chris Donaldson, and I'm so glad that you guys are deciding to join us for another episode of the project. Now, I'm super excited, especially early on, to have my good buddy and Alabama's number one, former number one, multi-time number one realtor, my good buddy, Ricky Carruth. So this episode is going to be a little bit different. We are both here live in the Atlanta Tech Village. We both literally just walked off stage, and now we are going to deliver a little bit more value to you. So as a reminder, if this is your first time listening, if you're a realtor, this podcast is for you. If you're a solo entrepreneur, this podcast is for you. If you're running a household, thinking about running a business, if you're stuck with an obstacle that you need to get over, this podcast is for you. So if this is the first time you found us, you're in the right place. My man, Ricky, how are you, dude? Good, good, really good. Yeah, so we're both just fresh off the stage. Mm -hmm. Now we're at a real estate conference. Yeah, yeah. So we were doing our best to talk to realtors. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in two different rooms at the same time, yeah. which was, you know, kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah. But um, real quick, why don't you just uh, say hello to the audience and remind them who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you guys for having me. Uh, I'm Ricky Carruth. I live in Orange Beach, Alabama. The, the, the Alabama boy. Alabama is actually the, 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 the country's best kept secrets is what we call ourselves down there because beautiful white sandy beaches right on the Alabama-Florida line. There's condos up and down the beach. We have 6.5 million visitors to our area every year. And the population is about 20,000 people. So it's a huge resort area. I grew up there. Um, I was blessed to actually grow up there. When you grow up in a place like that, as a kid, you take it for granted. You don't... Uh, you don't know how good you got it until you until you try to venture out and and, and you know try to, to you know see what else is out there in the world and then you realize wait a minute I grew up in the most beautiful place I grew up in, in, in one of the best places you could possibly live right there's not a lot of crime we don't worry about a lot of the politics there's 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 so much about Orange Beach that you don't worry about as a resident that the rest of the country does worry about if you want to worry about stuff. So, super blessed to have grown up there, live there, work there, sell real estate there. And, um, you know, I've been selling for 16 years. I went through the ups and downs of the market. You know, uh, I lost everything, I fought back, you know, and here I am. And now I'm just trying to make a difference in the world. So, yeah, I, and I love that about you because I think our missions are, are pretty aligned there. And so for those of you that are realtors, you know, you found your duo right here. But if you're not in real estate, I want you to pay attention because part of the Chris Donaldson project here is we're going to talk about similarities between when you're running any kind of business, whether you're an insurance agent, a real estate business, uh, whatever it is that you're doing. If you're in the mortgage side of things, solo entrepreneur, there's certain things that people are getting right, certain things that they're getting wrong. And we're in really interesting times right now because you're like me. I was just talking in my room, and I don't know what you were talking about over here, but I'm this generation they've recently identified as an exennial. Have you heard of this phrase yet? No. So think about this. Let's see if you can identify with this. So you grew up with Nintendo, uh -huh. but we still had to call girls on the phone. OK. 
Okay. Uh, when we got to college, there was no Facebook. Right, right. Cell phones were still analog. Yeah. But yep. then in our early adulthood came Facebook and uh -huh. the iPhone uh -huh. and all these various things. Uh -huh. So we're not really Generation X, but we, we're not really millennials. Right. We're kind of smashed in between. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. I like to say all the time about how when I got in real estate, there was no Zillow, there was no Facebook, there was no, yep. you know, Trulia, there was no, you know, really, you know, complicated CRMs, there was no, you know, social media period. And so when I got in real estate, I had to do everything the old fashioned way, phone calls, emails, postcards, letters, you know, all that. And then at, I grew my entire business that way. But once I made it to the top, you know, I just put my head down and worked. Right. And like, and like by the time I made it to the top, you know, and got to catch my breath 15 years later, I look back at, wait a minute, Facebook and social media and all these things have been around for maybe five, six, seven years by mm -hmm. then. And I was like, man, I think I might have missed the boat of something here by just being blinded by just trying to be the best. And so now I've incorporated all these old school techniques with all of these new technology techniques and now it's a monster and so what's really cool is is i'm at the age where uh like you say i was young enough not to have grown up with it but i'm still young enough to know how to use it as opposed to like my father you know or people that are 60 70 years old which by the way they're really catching on quick but i'm a little more tech savvy than they are so to me i think the ex-lineals are the most dangerous. <laughs> I think ex We are definitely dangerous. I think ex are the da most dangerous business people uh, because we understand the old school methods and we're young enough to appreciate and, 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 and understand the new school uh, methods of, of how to, you know, build business. Yeah, I, I think 100%. I mean, that's why I brought it up. I don't know if you've heard that term. No. But now you know who you no. are. <laughs> because yeah. the deal is, is I'm just as comfortable on Facebook as I am on the phone, as yeah. I am in person. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that, that those tweener generations, when you look at history, mm -hmm. are the ones that have like the big shakers and movers. Yeah. Because we can put our arms on both sides. Yeah. And we can identify with those Gen Xers and bring them along. Right. Right. We'll email or talk to you on the phone. Uh -huh. And then for the millennials out there that want to do nothing but text us or hit us on Facebook or on Instagram, we're there too. We're super dangerous. Right, so I, I think that the second thing that you said was it's never too late because both of us were late to the game at being way out there. Mm -hmm. There's nothing on the internet for me before 2015 ish. Mm -hmm. Right, nothing. right. I didn't hit I didn't hit social media until 2017. Yeah, exactly. Right. January 2017. If you go back to my Instagram, you'll see my first post was January 2017. I didn't have an account until then, and then after that, I mean. It's only been a year and a half that I've actually been working the internet, you right. know, to grow. So, yeah, for I mean, uh, of course. So, okay. so you're not afraid to push the limits. Absolutely not, man. And like, I know that about you. Yeah. But I mean, so, to, just to, to recap real quick, I think the biggest, and we both talk about this. I say it as perfection is the enemy of progress. People are waiting for the right time, the right thing, the right medium, everything to be perfect. Yeah. And then I'll do it, which never happens, right? It's just right. A, it's a procrastination statement. Um, for you, it's like, I'll just go do this and see what happens. Yep. So what's the number one reason, just boil it down to one, that you think people don't take action when you know they should? Like if you tell them you should do this on Facebook, you, it will make you money, and they don't, what do you think's the reason? Fear. Fear, right? They're just scared. And then what are they afraid of? I don't know. Me either. There's nothing to be afraid of, right? But fear is fear is the number one thing that holds people back. Yeah. And what are they scared of? They don't even know. Like, what's going to happen if you do that Facebook ad? What's going to happen if you call that person right. that you never talked to? What's going to happen if you, you know, whatever you're, what, if, 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 you, if there's something that you know is going to grow your business and grow your personal, you know, development, you know, and, and it scares you, but you know what's going to help you grow, then you need to gravitate towards that. It's, it's like it's like today, us public speaking. This is not my forte. Right. Public speaking is not my thing, although I'm starting to enjoy it more and more, but I, I get nervous. I mean, I get nervous before the speech. Um, 
you know, went across the street and ate at the, at the uh, Indian place, ate like two bites and threw it away because I'm nervous, right? Even though it's a small, intimate group, everybody loves me, everybody knows me, it's still a fear that I'm getting over, but I know that it's gonna help me grow overall what I'm trying wait, to do. Wait, wait, wait. Everybody in that room knew who you were before you walked in? No. Okay, so let's Probably start this over problem. again. Probably but have. in your head, you were thinking that, which gave you comfort. A lot of them knew me that I didn't know knew me. Well, hold on. Like I, like I assume, I assume nobody knows me, you know. And then, and then, and then when I find out, like, like afterwards, like I was talking, and all these people were watching, and I'm thinking these people have no idea who I am. Yep. Right. And then afterwards, like eight people come up to me and tell me how I've changed their life over the last year. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, y'all, I don't want to play poker with y'all. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. No kidding. So, but it's a fear is what I'm getting at that, that I'm conquering right now, okay? And then once I, I climb this mountain, there's gonna be another mountain of fear that I have to climb to get to the next level. For sure. Like if you don't- Look at this thing right here. How many people are afraid of that? There's Ooh. a camera with a light on, right? Most, not, most. Not the, not the lady over walking behind the camera, the camera itself, right? People are scared to death of it, uh, which yeah. is a huge advantage if you're not. I did a video on how to overcome your fear of camera, and that's a big thing, you know, is the fear of camera, the fear of cold calling, the fear of whatever. And you ask the person, what are they scared of? Mm -hmm. They don't have an answer. That's right. No, I think that's a great point. That's one of the things that me and you talk about, have talked about before and identify on is that usually the fear is something that hasn't been explored. Mm -hmm. It's an instant mm -hmm. fight or flight reflex, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you haven't really thought it through. Yeah. So once you ask them, well, what are you afraid of? What's the worst thing that's going to happen? They almost get frustrated because they know that the answer is not that impactful. And just by you asking them, hey, so what is going to happen? So you turn on the camera, what's going to happen? Or you make that phone call, what's going to happen? Yeah. You know, worst, I mean, literally the worst possible case scenario there ever could be. And then once you kind of just walk through that, you realize the fear is, I don't know, I'm nervous. Okay, well then practice. Right. You know, record a whole bunch of videos for you yeah. and put one out. Right. You shouldn't be practicing your clients. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, come, we'll come to that one in a minute. I, uh, think, I think everything's a practice run. Like you have to look at everything like it's a practice run. Absolutely. Because, because you're never going to be at the top of your game because there's always another level. And so, and so if you look at it, like when you're making cold calls, if you're scared to make calls, right? Go ahead and make 5,000 calls, not expecting to get any deals out of it. Look at that as a practice run, right? These, these speeches I'm doing are practice runs for me. This is practice. Same here. Right? When I, when I, go, when I start speaking for thousands of people, that's going to be practice for me from when I'm going to talk to tens of thousands of people. Everything is a practice run for the real thing that never comes. Yeah, well, I think that's a big mistake, and we've talked about this, and that is that as soon as you stop learning, or stop practicing, or stop honing your skills, you assume they're gonna be there, or like, oh, I've made it, then you become a depreciating asset. Like Michael Jordan practiced every single day harder than everybody else, and every single practice he started with bounce passes. Mm -hmm. I learned this from uh, his trainer gave a speech, and, uh, and, and he is awesome because he explains that Michael Jordan was the most talented and he was the hardest working and he wanted it the most. How are you going to beat that guy, right? So far too many people, they become Michael Jordan and they go, I got this. They don't show up to practice. We're talking about practice, right? They become Allen Iverson. We're talking about practice. So I don't need to practice my cold calls. I don't need to practice in front of a camera. I don't need to practice my speech. Then is when you get caught. Right, because there's always somebody that is practicing, that is hungry, that will take that from you, that will make more phone calls, will do better, whatever the case may be. I, I don't think we've ever discussed this because I know a little bit of your background, but what led you into real estate sales in the first place? Efficiency. I'm, I'm a master at, at figuring out what's most efficient. That's why I'm a single agent with 32 pending deals right now. But why, why real estate because, not I, something I, else? Because it's one class. Okay. Yeah. It is the most efficient, like, like I'm very good at figuring out what's the most efficient move to make at any given time. Why do you think that I'm a single agent with, you know, 
with, with all these deals? Why do you think that I'm able to maintain my real estate business while building the largest coaching company in the universe at the same time? Because I'm efficient. I understand things that are efficient and the mm -hmm. things that aren't efficient. I try things out. And when I, when I figure out what's, I'm like, oh, when I hit something that's efficient, I'm like, okay, here we go. I'm all in. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in college, um, I went to four different schools in two years. And I was like, this college thing is not efficient. No. Okay. And for me, not for everybody. And then when I realized that, that the real estate class, to get your real estate license was one class, I almost fainted. Because I was so, because it was like I hit the nail on the head. I knew exactly right then and there that that's what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. Now, what scared me was when I got in the real estate class is I started learning the timelines. <laughs> you know, like you get in the class, you pass the class, you have a year to take the test. You have, you know, 90 days to find somewhere to work. Then you have to take a pre -li a post license class within 60 days. Yep. And, and this was a time in my life, I was 19 years old. I was so far away from wanting to be committed to anything that 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 scared me I was like you know I'm just trying this out right I'm right. not I'm not all in yet you know and so I took the class and I was still apprehensive and I was like even after I passed the class I was like I don't know if I want to do this yeah I went back home and roofed houses for three days with my dad and I said I'm going to take the test and I'm yeah. going to get my <laughs> real estate license this is yeah this is easier than that so that's uh, kind of the story of how I got in it. Well, you know, for somebody that knows that process really well, I think that one of the advantages to a lot of industries, real estate's one of them, you know, insurance and some of these other ones, look, the barrier of entry is there, but it's not this huge giant hurdle. It's the next hurdle that comes after that, that most people forget. Yes. Right? Yes. So you go and you pass the test, you're like, okay, I did that. You do your post license and go, okay, I got that. Then the real hurdle is what? learning how to sell real estate and I'll tell you how you gonna get listings right well I'll tell you real estate is like poker it it can literally if you talk to the right person it will literally take you five or ten minutes to learn the entire game but a lifetime to master yeah really good uh, really you can good. you can learn poker you can learn all the hands and what beats what within a matter of minutes right but you start playing and you lose for five, ten years, you may not ever win, right? It takes a lifetime to master because poker, you have to learn how to read the people you're playing. Same thing in real estate. You have to learn to read your prospects, read the people that you're playing. Mm -hmm. And so I believe real estate is one of those things. Now, now what makes it an interesting dynamic and why so many people fail is because there's so much bad information. And people get caught up in, in all the different avenues of success of real estate. Yep. And there's so many bad roads there that that if they don't get lucky, and this is this is almost luck to run into the correct way to do real estate, then they could they could be going down the wrong road really fast and end up in a bad situation, you know. But well, and, and look, because of the availability of information, because of YouTube, because everybody can have an opinion and publish a book or anything, regardless of their credentials, we see that a lot. So kind of how I think me and you ultimately came together is we're at war with the same thing, which is that idea of failure, that there's a lot of these folks that are failing, that have every potential to succeed they possibly can. They're getting bad info. Mm -hmm. They're getting bad coaching. Because yeah. to, what does it take to be a coach? There's no license. There's yeah. no license because I say I'm a coach. You don't even have to have sold real estate. No. To coach real estate and, that, and look, it doesn't mean, and, and, and this is a question I had for you, it doesn't mean that you have to have sold to be a great coach necessarily, but I'm gonna, we're going to come back to that. But what I will say is, is that if you can have an SEO optimized site, you're on YouTube with me as a new realtor, I'm searching for how do I do this? And I find, and I go down this rabbit hole, I'm out of money, I'm out of time, I'm out of patience, I'm discouraged, and then I'm another statistic. So I call them the 19, that separation between the 1% that are really making it and the 20% in sales that should be making it. Yeah. Right? There's a big gap there of able and capable people. Mm -hmm. So I think me and you both know there's no shortage of success. There's no shortage of uh, of listings and the amount of business that's out there because there's going to be a big chunk that's not going to do anything anyway. You're not scared of it. I'm certainly not scared of it. 
And so I think that we almost feel the obligation that, hey, what can we do to help? And the number one thing is, let's get real information out there. Let's get this BS out of the way. Let's, the idea that, you know, you're gonna pay for this program and it's gonna magically, anything that says it's instant or it's a hack or it's short term or it's the magic or it's any of those things is a trap. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of coaches out there that are legit, sure. you know? Um, there's some legit coaches there's that charge. There's legit realtors. Yeah, there's legit coaches that charge, okay? Um, but how do you know the difference? Because they all look the same. And this, is, and this is why I coach for free, to separate myself from the entire pack. That way people don't have to make a judgment call. Is he legit or is he not? He's charging. So I'm, all, I'm automatically in that bucket of people who are charging for coaching, right? But then out of that bucket, now which is he? Is he legit or is he not? I don't even want that decision day. I don't even want anybody to even have to make that decision. I would rather be free, make money off books and speeches, and actually provide more value than all the paid coaches put together. So, and. Did you, is that something that you modeled, that you learned from, or that you thought about with, with Gary Vee? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it's the same thing he does, right? Absolutely. Um, I think that the, the long term, and the question, I have two specific questions for you, because we know each other well. One is, do you think people value free coaching as much as if they paid for it? In other words, do you think there's a percentage of people that because it's free access to you, mm -hmm. that will either take advantage of it or not value it simply because they're not investing in it. I think it goes both ways. If you charge for it, there's gonna be people that say it's BS, you know? And, and if it's free, you're gonna have people that say it's, it's, it's not worth anything because it's free. You get what you pay for, right? So, you know, you can look at it either way, you go, either way it goes. Here's the thing. When it's free, see, since I'm legit, since I have good intentions, since I actually want to reduce the failure rate in the real estate industry, since I actually want agents to succeed, here's the thing. When I'm free, there's no expectations. If I give you everything that I do on a platter and tell you to go do it and ask questions as we go and do live sessions every other week, and you do those things and it doesn't work, you can't come back to me and say, Ricky, you suck you know, your stuff doesn't work. Okay, I didn't charge you for that. So go do something else. Go pay a coach if you think that's what you need to do. I'm just trying to help you. I'm trying to teach you exactly how I do it. And then you can do what you want with that information however you want, but I'm not gonna charge you for it, right? On the flip side, when I'm, when I'm giving everything on a silver platter, right? I can give you every single thing I know on a silver platter without expecting you to pay me. Right. And so, and so now there's no expectations of you paying me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm not worried about that, you know? And so there's no expectations on either end. I'm trying to really help the industry. If you don't like it or if you think that I don't bring any value, that's fine. But here's the thing. You get a free look at it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, so the second question is that, do you think somebody to be a great coach has to have been a high producing realtor first? No. Can you expand on that? Because there's some people that believe if you haven't done it, that you can't be a great coach. And so I'm just I curious. don't believe it. I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of coaches that have never sold real estate that do suck yeah. at being coaches. Sure. Okay. But to answer your question, do you have to have sold real estate right. to be a great coach? No, you do not have to have sold real estate to be a great coach. And I'll, and I'll take it a step further. People who are super successful in the real estate coaching industry uh -huh. who have never sold real estate, mad props to you because you are the hustler of the year to be, to be a top coach in an industry that you've never even participated in. Mm -hmm. That is hustling to that that's the definition and beyond of, of what of a, of a true hustler so I actually like the guys that have never that have never sold real estate that coach real estate that are super successful at it because it kind it's kind of inspiring that they're able to do that a and but to answer your question no you do not have to have sold real estate to to be uh, a great coach so and the reason that I like to ask that question for those two reasons, because number one, everybody here is free, 
and you know they're going to dive in. The second is is that you know for instance uh, Vince Lombardi, I would let him coach anything, and he may not have been able to tackle a soul, but the guy could coach, right? But I think that when you're coaching, the principles and why I ask about uh, why you got into real estate, at the end of the day, real estate's a business. At the end of the day, the way you're operating, you're within the sphere of real estate, but the same principles apply if you're selling insurance, mm -hmm. if you're on the mortgage lending mm -hmm. side, mm -hmm. if you have a hardware store, yeah. you know, whatever the case may be, right? So I think that actually those principles can be tailored specifically to real estate. But where they may have an advantage is understanding that it's kind of universal. It's business principles, mm -hmm. a lot of it. We're giving them free coaching. Mm -hmm. It's what we're doing. But um, it, yeah, mad props to them. And I think it's really interesting because the reverse is there's a lot of companies out there that make a huge mistake in real estate. They take their top agent and they make them into a manager mm -hmm. or try to retro retrofit them into the broker. Mm -hmm. Or a top agent thinks that by being a broker, I'm going to be better off. And it's different skill sets management and sales and coaching and those things that they all have their place. Mm -hmm. So I think the reverse can also be true. Somebody can be great at sales and be awful as a manager or a coach and they should not have taken that. So it's knowing what you're best at and just triple, you know, just going all in on that. Absolutely. So I don't think I've ever asked you this. What's your biggest weakness? Organization. Organization. I'm I've so seen your office. <laughs> I am so unorganized, it's yeah. not even funny, and I don't care anything about it. So. Now, do you set specific goals every year? Like very specific, as in transactions or dollar amounts that you're gonna sell? I really don't. Um, now, so what guides your actions? Like how do you know you're at the right level of activity? Because I give it everything I got every day. Like, okay. I'm, go I, like I'm all in. I'm not, I'm, there's never a moment where I'm sleeping at my house, or like I don't take a day off and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, go do, you know, do stuff, right? Um, when I'm on social media, I'm trying to grow social media. I'm not browsing, you know, like, like every well, of second course. of the day is occupied with something that's productive. And so I'm not, I, you know, I'm not hard on myself. Mm -hmm. Like, like the results are the results. You can't control the results. Whenever I used to try to make goals around results, um, and you wouldn't hit the results because you made the goal too high or whatever and you become depressed. See, I've, mm -hmm. been, I've been through all this. Yep. And so I learned really quickly, like you can't control the results. So there's no need to really make a goal. You can have like an underlying goal that like I would like to do this or whatever. Like this year, you know, like I made a goal to do 1.5 million in commissions um, this year. You well, know. Hold on, you, so you did make a specific goal. No, 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 I'm telling you, there are underlying goals. There are underlying goals that mean nothing to me. See, like, 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 I, like I said to myself, you know, that's what I would love to do, love to shoot for. But here's what you can't do: you can't make that 1.5 million dollar goal, right? And then the market slows down this year, like it has, mm -hmm. and you can't control that. Mm -hmm. All I can control is my daily actions that I'm contacting, I'm connecting, and I'm staying relevant with all my clients. Mm -hmm. And so, as long as I'm doing that. 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, eight hours a day, nine hours a day, then, then I'm happy. See, there's a thing, there's a, there's a, there's a really, there's like a, there's like a gray area with goals and happiness. You know what I'm saying? Because people want to hit goals and that's what's going to make them happy. Right? You know, and if they don't hit the goals then they're unhappy. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that there's a, there's a gray area where you can be happy, but still motivated. And, 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 and you, you know, you could be content, but still hungry. You see what I'm saying? Where, whereas you're not, like, like I made the 1.5 goal. It's just, see, I'll throw numbers out there. You see, the thing is, is I'm not going to hit that. Why? Not my fault. I put the work in. I didn't hit it because the market flattened out because of interest rates. Right? That's the reason. Okay? That's the reason in my mind. That's what I'm going to tell everybody. Right? So, but I can't control the results, okay? So I'm, but, but here's the thing, I'm still happy with wherever I'm going to end up because the results are gonna happen the way the results are gonna happen. Well, what if you looked at it a third way? What if you looked at a goal as a percentage of market share? 
whether you were growing your share within your office, your board, your region, so you can't control the hard numbers, you can't control the transactions, yeah. but maybe it's how many listings, what yeah. my percentage is, is yeah. it going up or going down? Yeah. yeah, I would disagree with you only because I think that you have half of that right, that people attach their happiness to the achievement of goals or not, yeah. and they've got to realize that the pursuit is the fun. Yeah. And so it just gives you something to run at. Check this. To me, market share equals what agent has the most real relationships with the most property owners in the area. Uh-huh. Like say there's say there's ten thousand owners. Whatever agent has the most real real relationships, lifelong relationships out of those ten thousand owners uh -huh. owns the market share. Because mm -hmm. they own all the future they, have, they they own all the future business in the market. If they I, really have those relationships in place. How do you measure that? You don't measure it. You can measure it by results. You can say, okay, I have most of the real relationships in place, therefore I'm going to sell more than everybody in the area. And then at the end of the year, you say, okay, I sold this much, everybody else sold this much. I've got most of the market share, you know? I mean, I, I don't know how to measure it. I'm just telling you what my philosophy is. Right. You know, how to measure it's a whole other conversation, but the fact is, is that I'm measuring market share on how many real relationships I have with property owners in my area. Yeah. No, I, I think that's the really, it's interesting way that you look at things because what I would say is, is that that's a unique quality that you have mm -hmm. that a lot of people need that target to shoot for mm -hmm. so that they at least know how many phone calls they need to be making, yeah. right? How many people they need to be connecting with, how many relationships they need to start building. And I think if they don't set a number, um, yeah. It gives them an excuse to go, well, I try. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, whatever the case may be. I so, think the goals are good. Like when I when I got back in in 2008, you know, after the crash, after I lost everything and all mm -hmm. that, I sold a couple things, okay? I had, a, I had a goal to get 15. I wanted 15 listings, you know? And I remember I had a board. I had a number to 15. And then I got I had like two or three. I had like three listings. But I had the numbers going down the board, you know, where I was ready to fill them in. You know what I'm saying? And like that was my thing. You know, I was everything was focused around getting those 15 listings. You know what I mean? So I believe, like for real, like like there needs to be numbers involved and goals and all that. You know, I may have took the question a little too deep. You know, early. No, it's all good. Yeah. This is this is how you feel about things. There's no right or wrong. This, this is this is me talking about goals after 15 years of setting goals and hitting goals and not hitting goals uh -huh. and being depressed because I didn't hit goals so and, and, and hiring coaches and and this this is this is this is my conversation about goals after a 15 year career of losing my ass. You know what I'm saying? For sure. Oh, so it looks like the sessions are about to let out. So we, we may uh, we may have a little bit of noise in the background, but I think it's really interesting. And I think that part of what the project is about here and about what's interesting for me is that there are similarities between successful people and successful agents. And but there's also there's going to be things that are unique about them, right? What's unique about you? I think if you pulled a hundred. A lot of them would probably, at some point, have very specific goals. Right? Sure, because it's going to drive them, whatever yes. that may be. Yes, and I think that your goals are actually wrapped up in there. You just call them something different. I'll tell you what you my goals Because you gave me two or three of them that I could tell, I could repeat. What, to you. what I ended up, what but, I ended up making a goal when when I could when I didn't make that million dollars I wanted to make that year and became yeah. overly depressed is I said okay. Now my goal, because the number one agent in the state of in the state of Alabama for Remax is in my office, and so now my goal was just to beat him because I felt like if I could beat him, I would be number one. And so my goal every month, each month, was to get more listings than he got for 12 months in a row, which I did, and then I was number one that year, right? And so it depends on how you look at it. Be careful with the numbers. Be care, you know, you know, have relationships in there. Have you know, like like people that you're like, I, I have targets. I have coaches, real estate coaches right now that, that I want to beat. And so those kind of things drive me. Well, so what I really think we're talking here is the same language, targets, goals, you know, short term, long term, uh, whatever it is, people use different terms for similar stuff, right? Like I know if we get into YouTube and your Instagram and these various things, I know you have targets. I know you have goals. I know you do. So this whole idea that I don't, 
it's all fine and dandy, but you can call whatever you it's want. But I know that you do. It's the philosophy behind but are the, you happy? Are you creating a goal to, to, to because of what people think? Are you are you doing it for you? Why are you doing the goal? And what does the end result of the goal do for you in terms of who you are as a person and where your where your happiness is, where your work ethic is, right? Now I'm just saying it's not just a goal. I'm right. That. It's not. It's not a goal that we do, and then that it, 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 it's a part of your life, right? And the goal needs to be a lot, a little deeper than I want to make a million dollars, or I want to get a hundred listings, or I want to whatever. It needs to. There needs to be purpose behind the goal. Exactly, and that's where people get it wrong. They don't attach their dream, their purpose, their vision first, and then start setting goals. Right. Your goal should be things that fulfill you and make right, you happy. Right. Right. It shouldn't be money. Exactly. I mean, money can be a part of it once you realize what I'm saying. Right. But it can't start out with money, and that's where, that's where, that's where there's a lot of people who have a lot of money that commit suicide. Yeah. No, I don't disagree. I mean, look, it, the affluent communities have the higher rates of, of suicide than those that don't, right? I mean, it's statistical. And I think a big reason for that is keeping up with the Joneses and all that stuff. So I think it's interesting that when I say the word goal, you immediately think money. And I think that that's part of the, the issue is that people yeah. don't understand that there's different things you can be shooting for. Right. And there's different guiding principles. And if you start backwards, what do I want to be? What, who do I want to become? Yeah. Um, I think that that makes it much more relevant. Yeah. And I think it's really funny when we get on that conversation because the reverse is definitely true. Sure. There's so many people out there that use their goals and this and that. Yeah. Set smart goals. This is how you do it. And like people don't even understand why am I doing this? Where does this hundred thousand dollars is my favorite number? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. did that come from? Yeah. I ask people that all the time. If an employee comes to me and asks for a raise and they ask for this number, my instant reverse question is, where did you come up with that number? And if they give me a religious reason why, like they tell me this will be able to afford my mortgage so I can get out of my parents' house, that number makes sense. Yeah. But a lot of times, just like sellers, that number just came out of nowhere. Yeah. And if it ends at a zero, it's definitely weird. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like where did that number come from? Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that it's important to understand that if somebody was to go backwards, like, look, I need to pay off my student loans and they're this much.